Hello all. In this short video, I'm going to talk about linear and quadratic discriminant analysis, LDA and QDA, which is basically a method for, um, I would say, classifying data and creating uh, the classification boundaries when uh, the uh, centers of and the, the covariance matrices of the clusters of data are known. So basically, it's typically uh, following a um, mixture of uh, Gaussian models, right? So Gaussian mixture models, uh, actually it should be GMM, not MMG. So it's typically uh, after GMM, so let's say I have these two clusters of data in this picture and uh, using GMM, I could uh, find their centers, their me means and their covariance matrices and classify the data as belonging either to this cluster or the other cluster, right? And find my uh, probability functions. Then uh, the boundaries here that are separating the two classes are those uh, points in the feature space for which the probability of basically the observations of one class, the one cluster, given those data points, right, is the same as probability of what? Uh, the observations in the other cluster given those data points, right? or the points that are basically having the same probabilities from the two classes, okay, as you can see here. So if you can find these two conditional probabilities for these uh, unknown points, right, and find the location of these unknown points, then when we connect these points together, we can come up with the classification boundary. And these boundaries could be straight lines, they can be bent curves like this or so on but in general if i call one of them f1 of mu1 and sigma1 and the other one f2 of mu2 and sigma2 and then i say these two are equal and then take both of them to one side so f1 minus f2 is equal to zero and i call that f1 minus f2 the uh, f in general of these four parameters at x equals zero, then I can say this is the relation that you need for what? For uh, the uh, classification boundary. So this one and this one are what? These are equivalent to each other, whether you describe it by equality of these two uh, conditional probabilities or you say it this way, that's basically the same thing, okay? So the goal is to come up with the boundaries. Now, if the covariance matrices of these clusters are the same, then you can easily show that what? The uh, boundaries will definitely be lines, okay? So the boundaries will be lines. Mathematically, you can show that the uh, when you connect these points together with equal probabilities, they would be on a line if the sigma 1, 2, 3 are equal. On the other hand, if they are not equal to each other, then the boundaries will be quadratic curves, will be uh, like x2 is a quadratic function of x1. And so this one on the left, we call it linear discriminant function or linear boundaries. The one on the right, we call it quadratic discriminant function or analysis. And this guy is called LDA. This one is called QDA, okay? Now, what are the um, forms of the boundaries? So for this one on the left, if I say that the um, linear discriminant function for one of the clusters is at any arbitrary point x, where x is a 2D vector, is x transpose sigma inverse mu k, right minus one half mu k transpose sigma inverse mu k plus log of pi k and this sigma by the way is sigma of k okay so this is also sigma of what that's the uh, cluster k so this is what this is the linear discriminant function for uh, one cluster 
And if I set it equal to the linear discriminant function for another cluster, if these two delta functions are equal, that is where these probabilities are equal, and that is where the um, boundary lies, right? So all of the X points for which these two deltas are equal, those are the boundary points. And if we set them equal and bring everything to one side, then clearly the equation of the boundary is going to be this guy here, right? You can see that this X transpose sigma inverse is there, mu K minus mu L. Now you know that there is a mu K and a mu L, but they are what? They are equal. That's why here we did not use a subscript for sigma Y because sigma of L and sigma of what? K are the same thing. So they are all equal to sigma, right? That's why we only use one sigma and not several sigmas. So we factor it out and then this one half term mu, the mu's are different. So you have to factor it out like this. And then these two logs, when you subtract them, it's going to be the log of the division. And if you look here, everything is a number except for x, right? Because uh, the pi k and pi l are known numbers. So this is a single number here. This is a single number. This is a, a single number. This is a matrix. So this whole thing will be a number. And then here, uh, this is also a, a number or vector multiplied by x transpose. So in general, the only term of x that you see here is this guy, a linear term of x. So clearly the boundary is going to be what? It's going to be a line, as you can see. On the other hand, if uh, the sigmas are not equal, then your quadratic discriminant function is this function here. And if you look at it, it's quite a bit similar to the uh, linear one with some differences. What is the difference? The log pi k is there, right? Here you have a constant term, negative one half log of sigma k, right? Which is in place of uh, this constant term here. And then here you have a quadratic term in terms of x. Again, if delta x is the same as uh, delta k of x is the same as uh, delta l of x, then that gives you what? That gives you a quadratic curve. And the reason for that is you have a quadratic function equal to another quadratic function, right? And so the decision boundaries can be what? Quadratic. You can simplify this in terms of quadratic terms and linear terms, but in general, it's going to be what? It's going to be a part of a parabola. So this is what? This is linear and quadratic discriminant. Now, one other thing before we go to the MATLAB code and the fact that the boundaries, they do depend on all of the data, right? Remember, in support vector machines, our boundaries depend only on what? Only on the support vectors, nothing else. So that makes the computation a little bit less intensive. Here, the boundaries depend on all of the data. That's why they are robust to noise and outliers. So if you add an outlier blue data here, right, it's not going to shift this boundary and this boundary really significantly, or if you add some noise, because all of the data will determine the boundary and not one. And you might say, where is it that all of the boundary is determining all of the, or the boundary here? Because this is the equation of the boundary, right? This is the equation of the boundary here. So where is it that all the data is showing? Because as you can see, here, uh, the parameters that are affecting the equation of the line are what? Sigma, mu k, and mu l, these three parameters. That's all it is. And these constants, pi k and pi l. So where is it that all the data is coming up? And that's exactly where you calculate these mu's, sigma, and pi's. You know they come from what? They come from all of your data. Just in my previous lecture, when I talked about Gaussian mixture models, I showed you that when you want to calculate mu, sigmas, and pi's, you have to use all of your data, right? So if you go uh, and look at these uh, formulas in my previous lecture, 
you can see that I need to use what? I need to use, go over each and every one of my observations, right? For mu, for sigma, right? I have to go over all of my observations and that's why uh, when you pass your data X, your X data observations and the labels to the uh, discriminant function in MATLAB, let's say, it has to first determine the mu's, sigmas, and pi. So first it has to perform a GMM, then it can find the boundaries for you. Okay? And it is therefore a little bit computationally demanding. Okay? And the other thing for demanding the computation is it needs to invert the covariance matrices as well, which you can see here. And for this case, where the, deter the matrices are two by two, it's not a big deal. But when the dimension of the feature space is very large, inverting that big matrix also could be computationally demanding, okay? But uh, this is, in general, what the simple theory of LDA and QDA. Now let's take a look at some MATLAB code together. Okay, so here is the MATLAB code. And uh, here I have three mu's, three sigmas, and three n's. For LDA, I use my sigma 2 and 3 to be similar to the same as sigma 1. And uh, I use my MVN rand command to generate random numbers from the multivariable normal distribution. And using uh, mu 1, sigma 1, n1, and similarly for 2 and 3, concatenate them together, create the labels for them and use gscatter to uh, do the scatter plot with different colors for different uh, clusters. Then I use the command fit c this cr and fit c discriminant is I pass to it my training data and the labels, right? So you see, I do not pass to it any mu or any sigma or anything, okay? Which you need for the equation of this line. So the algorithm has to find mu, sigma, and the pi's first, then find the equation of the line, right? And that takes some computation. So it calculates that. And then since it's linear, I get the coefficients out of this LDA. And first I do it for between class one and two, right? And I get the constant out of it and the linear coefficients, right? And the equation of the line is going to be a times x plus b equals 0. But your x has two components, x1 and x2. So your equation is going to be what? It's going to be basically a number 1 times x1 plus a number 2 times x2 plus b equals 0. Okay? Here, x1 acts like x and x2 acts like y, basically. That's the equation of the line. And now if I form my x1 through uh, some column operator here, from the min of the x minus 0.1 to the max of the x plus 0.1 with increment of 0.1, and then my x2 or y, I get it from this equation. I take a1, x1, and b to the other side and divide both sides by a coefficient 2. That gives me the x2 or yy in this case. And then I plot my xa and yy with black color to form the line. And then I repeat the same thing, this one between class 1 and 3 instead of class 1 and 2. And here 1 and 3 are basically, 1 is in the center here, 2 and 3 are on the sides. So I do 1, 2, and 1, 3, and I... Uh, get my two classes. Now, in general, you can have three lines. You can do one also for two and three, but in this case, I really don't need that. So I just do one, and because the uh, way the classes are separated, two of the lines are enough, but in general, you can generate three lines. Okay, so this is what you got. This is one class, this is one class, and this is what? One class, and these are what? These are the lines separating the classes of data together. So this is what, this is my linear discriminant analysis result. Then I go ahead and I create um, the QDA. So this time I create new set of data. I don't need to do it on the original data. And the reason is I want my sigmas to be different this time. 
So here I use different sigmas matrices. And again, I generate my data label and everything. And this time, the only thing I change in this fit C discriminant is the discriminant type and I pass it quadratic. Last time it was what? It was linear. And since it's the default, if you just eliminate this part of the code altogether, and again, it's gonna give you linear. So if you don't say discriminant type, it assumes it's linear, but you can say it if you want. And here you have to definitely say that it's quadratic. So you generate that. Now this time, the equation of the line is a parabola. So if I go between classes one and two, you have three coefficients, a constant, a linear term, and a quadratic term, and I call them K, L, and Q. And the thing is, the L and the Q are going to be multiplied by what? By both X1 and X2. So you see here, the components of L are multiplied by them, and the component of the Q are multiplied by them. So if you have X1, in order to find X2, you have to use a what? You have to use a, a quadratic equation to solve for X2. That's one way to do it. The, uh, to find it explicitly x2 in terms of x1 so you have an equation like that right or you can use an implicit function here in this case so here i uh, create an anonymous function of x1 and x2 which is the constant k plus l1 times x1 plus l number 2 times x2 q11 times x1 x squared plus q12 plus q21 times x1 times x2 plus q2, 2 times x2 squared, right? That's the equation quadratic. And what I do, I'll pass the whole range of my x and y, or x1 and x2 in this case, and the function to uh, something called f implicit, okay? And you might say, what is this function f implicit? Because I pass to it as an argument the handle to a anonymous anonymous function and some x min x max y min y max or x1 x2 min and x1 x2 max so here is the matlab help for it and this is a beautiful function which plots implicit functions so you don't have to find x2 from as a function of x1 an implicit function and then plot it this guy, if you give it a relation, an implicit relation between X and Y without the need to solve one uh, based on the other, it plots it for you. All you need to pass to it is the function and the interval, as you can see. So that's a beautiful function, which I can use here. And uh, for color of it, I pass K. For line width, I pass 2. And you see here that plot has a handle, so I can modify its properties using the dot operator. Okay, so now I plot my um, uh, first parabola here between class 1 and 2, and then I repeat that between class 1 and 3, and I call it what? Quadratic discriminant analysis. So let me show you that part. There we go. So now this is my data, and you clearly see that here you have two uh, parabolas that are separating your classes right and sometimes there might be some small problems here okay or there if the classes are what are overlapping with each other so do not expect something completely perfect to come out of this if your clusters are what quite a bit uh, closer to each other right but you clearly see that here the qda is applied and you can see that the boundaries are, the classifying boundaries are the curvatures or the parabolas. So hopefully the video was useful to you and I will see you in my next lecture. Thank you.